Daniel Lapin, the author of Thou Shall Prosper, is my guest today at the Invest Diva Movement. This book has quickly become my favorite read so far in 2020, and it taps on the biblical money principles a lot of people in today's society either don't know about or choose to ignore. If you really want to understand why you're not as good with money as you could be, and if you want to find out the secrets to becoming wealthy, then you've got to say it with us today until the end of the episode. Click on that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on our next episode that is going to help you with your Invest Diva journey. My name is Kiana Danielle. I'm the founder of the Invest Diva movement, a tribe of proactive moms who want to create a better life for their kids. We don't rely on our husbands, the bank, or money managers to determine our financial future. In fact, we do the exact opposite. We take control of our money because our financial independence is bigger than just us, is for our kids and their children to come. We're different because we're fighting against the boys on Wall Street. We don't want our money locked up in a 401k. We're not going to let it sit in the bank and lose its worth. So with that, let's go and say hi to Rabbi Daniel Lapin and find out about how his book, Thou Shall Prosper, can help us on our journey. And let's get the movement going. <laughs> Super excited to have you here. I am such a big fan of this book, Thou Shall Prosper. Thank you so much for being on the show. And the first question that I wanted to ask you is what on earth made you to write this book and why is it called Thou Shall Prosper? Um, well, the, uh, the second question first, because it's easier to answer. Um, I had originally titled the book, Holy Money. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, my God, I love that. <laughs> um, I thought so, and you think so. Unfortunately, my publisher did not think so. And one of the things I've learned is that people who've been in business for a while tend to know their business. And so when my publisher said, no, um, how do you like Thou Shall Prosper?, um, I, uh, I said, well, it doesn't immediately work for me, but I think you're probably right. You know your business. And they were absolutely right. Uh, Holy Money would not have sold the huge numbers of books that Thou Shall Prosper, the Ten Commandments of Making Money did sell. So uh, that's the, the title I take no credit for, but they were absolutely right. And how I came to write the book is because many, many friends, non-Jewish friends around the country. And I, I speak to live audiences uh, 12, 13, 14 times a year. And um, many of, of those people have heard me many times. Eventually, many of them became comfortable enough uh, to ask me one of the questions that was really bothering them. And the question just kept on coming up again and again and again. And that was, uh, why are Jewish people disproportionately good with money. And, and I was forced to acknowledge the fact that they were absolutely right. You know, the Forbes list, the annual list of Forbes magazine, the 400 richest Americans. Well, given that Jews make up less than 2% of America's population, there should be at most about eight Jews on the Forbes list of, of the 400 richest Americans. And yet there are never fewer than 60, usually closer to 100, uh, you know, which is more than a 10 times overrepresentation. And I would always feel a little embarrassed by the question, and I used to say, uh, uh, well, you know, there really are poor Jews as well. And I say, yeah, yeah, of course, but the fact is, wouldn't you agree that Jews are disproportionately good with money? And I thought to myself, and I realized the only honest answer is, yes, absolutely. And what is more, it's also true to say that, um, that the, th that my embarrassment at the question was evil. It was just plain evil. The very fact that I felt embarrassed by that question showed that I believe deep down in me that there must be something reprehensible 
about financial success. And uh, so I then set on a lengthy process of studying all the Torah sources, all the ancient Jewish wisdom sources, so as that I could get rid of my contemporary progressive view of money and finance and replace that operating system in my soul with a biblically based operating system. In other words, what I was really determined to do, and it took many, many years to do it, I was determined to find out what did God have in mind for human economic interaction. And once I had completed that research, it just screamed out aloud for a book. And the book, Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commandments for Making Money, uh, is the result. So were you rich first? Because I feel like you have to have that relationship with money and you have to be mindful that money is a good tool. Money is not the root of all evil in order to become prosperous and financially successful. So which one came first for you? Yeah, you put your finger on that. Uh, it's in fact one of the Ten Commandments. It's a very long and important chapter in the book is indeed reshaping your perception of money. Now, um, have you noticed that in the culture, there is general denigration of financially successful people? Have you noticed, for instance, that when politicians tell their life story, they always start off by saying, I grew up poor. Have you noticed that? I do that. <laughs> Guilty. I'm sorry? I, it's my story too. I, yeah. All right, well, it's nothing to be proud of. Yeah. It just means that your parents did not practice these principles unless there were extenuating circumstances. And I do know a little about your background and the oppression and indeed extenuating circumstances. It wasn't my parents, it was the government, but yes. Yeah, right. Um, in, so, um, so that's very important. It's also important to note that there are phrases used in the culture. I'm sure you've heard over the last 12 years or so, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the rich must pay their fair share. Right? Right. What does that mean? That means, number one, that the rich have not been paying their fair share. They're a pretty reprehensible and scurrilous crowd, a really bad crowd. That's the first thing it means. And what is the next thing it means? It means that we will decide what they should pay because the word fair is not only totally undefined, but because of that lack of definition of the word fair, there is no word for it in the Hebrew language, in the Lord's language, which so is why. That, but you are a uh, big fan of giving to charity. That has nothing to do with fairness. Okay. How are they different? Nothing, nobody, but nobody has any right to your money. Nobody. Now, I have an obligation to give charity, but it has nothing to do with fairness. It's, the goal is not to make the recipient of my charity as wealthy as I am. That's not the goal. So what is the goal of a charity then? The goal of the charity is uh, twofold, but primarily to produce in me a sensitivity to other people and to uh, f teach me to relinquish my grip on money. Because a grip on money is uh, completely antithetical to making money. Because as, and it's a large part of your show, uh, what you have to be able to do is you have to make an investment. Now, every investment has risk with it. If it had no risk, then it would have zero potential for profit. And I, I mean, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And so that means I have to reach into my pocket and take money out and put it into your business in the hope that 
your business may or may not succeed, but I hope it will succeed and that I will benefit from my investment. But at the same time, there's a part of me saying, don't take your money and put it into into uh, her business. No, put it into a bank account in, the, in a safety deposit box. Uh, that's the best thing to do. And so both charity and investment teach me the need to loosen the grip a little bit. Can, can you tell me a little bit about what people will find in your book, uh, Thou Shall Prosper? I mean, I've read it. I think it's absolutely fascinating, but I wanted to hear it from your perspective. What is the, what is the, um, what is the one thing that people should take away from this book? Um, that's a little bit like saying to a man, what is the one thing that makes a woman attractive? <laughs> I love that. There are um, 10 things. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, condensing it all to 10 was in itself. A, an arduous and grueling exercise, I can tell you. But let me, let me nonetheless try and answer your question. Um, first of all, I would say the book isn't for everybody. Um, if, if you are somebody who has essentially evolved or devolved a passive kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle of um, existential... Um, uh, satisfaction, um, a li uh, if your lifestyle is one um, where you feel that you are at the whim of outside vectors that shape your life, and, and you generally feel that, that you are a victim of circumstance and that somehow or another life just carries, if you're convinced of that, then buying this book is a waste of money. Uh, for people who are so passionate and so filled with life and are so determined to make more of their life, uh, for which money is an absolutely inevitable prerequisite, well, then this book is life-changing, as, as many of the reviews online uh, attest to. Uh, people do find it completely life-changing. It absolutely is. I cannot stress enough that you should and must. It's, it's not a very long read. It like, just get dive into it. Like These are just frameworks. It cannot be done in one day and it sounds very scary yeah. when we just put it in like, oh, title, oh, money is not bad. Okay, but that is going to go away. You, you're going to hear it right now and if you don't take action on it, it's going to go away. You really actually have to understand the principles. So go ahead, get this book. I have a link on, uh, for it to it in, uh, um, below this video. And again, thank you so much, Rabbi, for coming back, for joining thank us. Thank you. Great being with you. There is one tradition that we do uh, on my show, and that is I ask our guests to make a silly face. Hello. <laughs> you gotta do it. Don't care if you're a rabbi. <laughs> Um, and what would be some examples of that that have been successful? Anything that makes you very embarrassed and feel silly and is not in your normal face, I would think it would go. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, what is my normal at rest face is an angry scowl. <laughs> <laughs>